protests are popping up around the world against something called 15-minute city. It, it's reminiscent to me as well uh, to, of what's happening in the UK, most particularly in Oxford and Cambridge, in relationship to the 15-minute city. This is George Orwell on steroids. You in your area will only be allowed within that 15-minute zone that you've been allocated. Now. The 15-minute cities are put forward as a solution to the problem of undue distance to travel. And so the idea is that wouldn't it be lovely if we had walkable neighborhoods where everything you needed was within easy reach. So get this, the World Economic Forum is now looking to reduce ownership of private vehicles. But I looked into the C40 websites. The C40 is the consortium of municipalities that have signed on to the 15-minute city plan. And I read in their own documentation, this is relevant to the uh, tri-state city idea, that their goals are to reduce caloric calc caloric consumption to 2,500 calories a day by, by force, essentially, within the next 15 years, to ensure that the peasant class, which is everybody but the elitists, can't fly more than one time every three years, to not merely shift private car ownership from fossil fuel to electric, which is fundamentally impossible because the grid can't handle it, but to eliminate 90% of, of private car ownership. Well, welcome to the program. 15-minute cities, are they real or just a myth? I'm Ken Michael, and joining me is Pastor Josh Schwartz, and we're going to take a look at that uh, today, these 15-minute cities. You know, I heard about these probably 10 years ago, and I have to be honest with you, Josh, I, I didn't think it was real. No. Until I realized I was actually living at one, and we're going to talk about that, These some of these retirement communities that are mm -hmm. set up and other uh types of cities that they're setting up. So let's talk about what what is the goal of a 15-minute city? Who's involved in it? Well, the goal is to obtain a net zero emissions. Uh, that is virtually impossible if you're following what's going on and if you're following uh, how these electronic uh, devices and cars and all this are made. It's virtually impossible to have a net zero emissions, but that's what they're telling people. And the purpose is to control uh, movement of the population. They want to control everyone, uh, where they go, what they do, what they buy, what they sell. They want to control businesses. They want to control water and food, uh, that the very food systems that are that are set up right now, they want to control. Absolutely, but it's all going to be in the name of convenience. Convenience for you, where you don't have to go very far. You don't have to travel outside of your little realm to get what you want and to uh, eat what you need and to be with the people that you want to be with. They want to keep it very convenient within a 15-minute city for you. Yeah, what I like to call it is a restricted area. I mean, you're going to literally be confined to a general area. And I think if we look at how the United States is laid out right now, they start in the main city area, you know, like we live in Minneapolis, for for example, and then they spread out to the suburbs. And if you look at all the suburbs, and I've been all across the country, every suburb of every major city is laid out the same. They're, they're cookie cutter mm -hmm. uh, replicas of each other. They have the same stores, the same shops, uh, the same restaurants. Everything's laid out the same. You can get health care there. And what they want to do is have you walk ride your bike or take your electric vehicle. You you see the uh, explosion of electric scooters that are out there. This yeah. is this is a replica of what Europe's doing right now. When we were over in Europe, no one hardly drove a car over there yeah. because first of all, it's it's you can't afford it. Gas is so high. Uh, the cost of a vehicle is so high that you can't afford to drive. So most people uh, walk, ride their bike, electric vehicles, electric scooters, and mass transportation, uh, as we'll talk about here in a minute. But let's let's look at who's funding this, because not only is this in Europe, it's already being set up here in America. All the major corporations are involved in this. You take you know FedEx and mm -hmm. Ikea, Google. I mean, every major corporation is is funding this. And now you have mayors jumping on board from every major city. What do we have, 130 mayors yeah. across the when country? When you look at the, the C40 uh, 
140 website. They they boast of having 130 mayors worldwide. And what's fascinating is this whole uh, idea with C40 is to uh, have a new green global initiative to where they keep you focused because of the name of climate change to staying in your location to uh, lessen your carbon emissions, your carbon footprint, so that everyone buys in on this. And they're going to really roll it out continent by continent, country by country. The only continent that they don't have cities on right now is Antarctica. Yeah, and city by city. In fact, when you look at it, this is very well organized, very well funded. They're meeting on a regular basis. And all of these mayors agree that uh, they they – they equate it to climate change, and they all say there there is no justice without social justice. This climate change justice that they speak of is just full on. Mm-hmm. So you talked about these these C forty cities and what their plan is. As as we said, it's very well organized, very well funded. They want to eliminate combustible engines by ninety percent. I mean, think about that, and then move us all into these small housing units, tiny houses they call them or multi-level housing develop there's multi-level housing everywhere it's exploded in this country yeah. and then of course they want to regulate what we eat they want to get rid of meat and regulate what we eat and then take us all and put us into mass transportation and you see light rail exploded throughout the country about 15 20 years ago right. it's totally unaffordable that none of it gets paid for But that's what they're doing in Europe. We're following Europe's plan. Right. And let's just take that systematically, those four steps really quick. When it comes to the very first one, they want to move from combustible engines to electric cars. We all know that that's not sustainable. We all know that the lifespan of a battery is nowhere near the lifespan of a combustion engine. So it it totally raises the prices for this. Then secondarily, as we live here in Minneapolis, when you drive around and you see uh, the new construction, there's two things that are being constructed. It's going to be warehouses and apartment buildings. It's amazing that they're not constructing any new single family homes. I haven't seen any at all. They have plots out for them. They have neighborhoods that are designed for them, but they're not building houses. And it's all smaller dwellings, small housing, condominiums, like you said, apartments. And that's what they want to, they want to force people from the, not, not just the suburbs, but the, um, the outskirts from, and force them into the urban areas. And yeah. it's a very well laid out plan. I, it's a, it's a very evil plan when you, when you think about it. I mean, they're putting people uh, and forcing them in because we know, like you said, the electrical grid can't handle no. what, what they want to do as far as transitioning us from combustible engines to elect to electricity uh we're seeing black rolling blackouts all over the country right, right now right. and they're saying we better get ready for those and expect those here in the near future now just imagine this kid you know every summer uh here in minneapolis and on the west coast you deal with heat waves right and so Everyone starts running their air conditioner and we see these brownouts and we see all over the the major media sources. You can't be uh, having your AC set to 68 degrees, set it to 72 so that you can not weaken the grid. Could you imagine the weakness of the grid if 90 percent of the population, let's not even say 90 percent, 75 percent of the population was charging their electric car every night? It would shut down every single day. Well, not only that, but we haven't even factored in the the terrorist plot oh, sure. that that could happen and probably will. They're warning us, the FBI is warning us that could very well happen. In fact, we should expect that. And one of the major targets, obviously, is the electrical grid. And all it would take is a few spots and you mm-hmm. could wipe out literally uh, the electrical system for major cities for days, weeks, and possibly even months because we are not prepared for something like that. Right. We are not prepared to handle that, uh, unfortunately. So- how are they going to market this? Sure. They have to market this and they're doing, they're trying to do a good job of it. So let's take a look at this clip and I'll show you uh, some of the things that they're doing to market this plan. In January of 2021, Saudi Arabia announced plans for its own futuristic city called The Line. Instead of communities sprawling outward from a central location, they would be built vertically and arranged, well, 
in a line, hence the name. Even though the vision for the city stretches 170 kilometers, it would do away with cars entirely and instead be connected by high-speed rail that would travel the entire length in just 20 minutes. It would have greenery stretching along the top, an open-air ventilation system to help maintain an ideal climate year-round, and it would house up to 9 million people. The 15-minute city is actually about getting people to, um, or enabling basically, uh, walking and active travel to shops, schools, uh, and basically places where they want to go. The line is expected to be loaded with countless sensors, cameras, and facial recognition technology that, in such a confined space, could push government surveillance to almost unthinkable levels. But the, the, what I'm getting to is these smart cities are clearly coming, and they're already here to some degree every time we use our cards and that sort of thing. But they're clearly taking it to a higher level of complete control. And again, they, this isn't conspiratorial. They say they're going to do it. So is the 15-minute city a 15-minute prison or just a compelling urban strategy? That's probably the fundamental question of our time. So that's why we have to say no to all of these things. We have yeah. to say no to CBDCs. We have to say no to digital identity. We have to say no to 15-minute cities because they're all the same thing. But it's problematic. It's hard in Western society, in the mind of modern men nowadays, to tell them that you know those nice little pretexts that they use to sell this to us are not actually the truth. We need a return to real ethical debate about where we want to go as a civilization. And she's absolutely right. What I call these are literally digital prisons. They're, they're digital concentration camps. And I don't say that lightly because it literally confines people to an area. It defines what they can and cannot buy and sell. Does that sound yeah. familiar? I mean, this is what we're doing, folks, is modeling what China is already doing right now. And I've spoken to people that live over there. They said, you cannot go anywhere. You cannot do anything. You cannot buy anything without the government knowing it. And that's, we, we help them set that system up. Absolutely. And Silicon Valley said the one they have set up for America here in the United States is even better. So they say. And so what we're watching is a uh, complete 24 seven surveillance of every public space and many private places, uh, places that you think you can go and have privacy are, are going to be surveilled. So it's controlling our movement. It's controlling just about everything we do. And what I like to say, and I, what I teach is we're witnessing the setup for the beast system. We absolutely are. And the beast system is uh, most uh, clearly defined in Revelation chapter 13. And really when it's put down to it, it's using technology to be able to confine people to places and uh, allow them to not be able to buy or sell without a mark on their hand. It's an ultimate scheme of control. Now, can you said in the beginning of the video that um, you experienced a 15-minute city? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So after I retired from law enforcement, I moved out to, to Arizona. Mm -hmm. And there are literally dozens and dozens, of, not in, just in Arizona, but across the country, of of 55 and older uh, settlements. And when you get there, you're like, wow, this is great. This is beautiful. Uh, I could ju do just about anything and drive in my golf cart. I could go play golf. I could go to restaurants. I could go to shops. I could go work out in the facilities. They have swimming pools there. I mean, we're already being programmed. My, my oh, yeah. generation, especially, and younger people are now being programmed that, hey, this is the way to live. I'm in a gated community. It's safe. I can literally access everything I need. All of, all of the health care was, was just a, a block away. I could go under a tunnel and drive to all the shops that I wanted to. And it's so convenient because you're in your golf cart. You don't have to take your car out and you can literally socialize and do all the things that uh, you, you want to do. However, what they want to do is restrict it to just that so that you can't go anywhere else. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what it comes down to. It is control in the name of convenience. Here, we'll give you everything you need in a tiny little footprint, and we'll just keep you uh, humans constrained to do what you want to do 
uh, so that you don't mess with our overarching scheme and plan so that you don't overwhelm the planet uh, with your carbon footprint. What's fascinating to me, I was in a conversation this last weekend thinking about these exact same things and the idea came across. If God created everything, did he not create everything that we need? A sustainable planet, give us all the resources we need. If God is sovereign over creation and put everything perfectly in place, does he not give us the amount of resources that the amount of population that is on this planet now needs and will will be there in the future? Of course it did. Of course God created everything perfectly. Of course he had an absolute plan for our good on this earth. But when humanity tries to take it into their own hands and control it, that's when we get into issues like we have here. Yeah, and government is totally overstepping their boundaries and their responsibilities as government. And what we're witnessing, folks, and we've been saying this every week, what we're witnessing is the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the World Banking System, their plan is coming together Exactly. And, and they've had decades to, to work on this. And now they believe they're at the point in time in history that they can implement all yeah, this. Exactly. That's so exactly that's- what they're doing. Their plan is coming right into place. As Jan says, it's not falling apart. It's falling right into place. And friends, I think it's important for us to understand that these things uh, are overwhelming. These things might uh, initiate fear in our minds. Uh, what do we do? How do we Uh, How do we live? Do we move from our rural area to an urban area? Even if we're forced, how do we deal with these things? I think we have to keep on our forefront of our mind the reality of God's grace, that he sent Jesus as our Savior, and he will sustain us. Now, that doesn't mean that everything's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that we aren't going to suffer persecution. It doesn't mean that we aren't going to have to endure hardships but it does mean that he loves us, he cares for us, and he will provide for us in the time that we are living. We must learn to suffer well, to entrust our souls, to entrust our bodies to a sovereign God and suffer well. Yeah, we are going to experience, church, some of man's tribulation and these things we're talking about. Like I said, I would have never believed this Mm -hmm. uh, just 10, 12 years ago. I would have said, you know, you're crazy. That that's never going to happen. But when you look at the things we talked about 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, uh, they're happening, not because we're smarter than anyone else, but a lot of scripture tells us this was going to happen. So folks, these things are not coming They're already here, so we should be prepared for that. Amen? Amen. And I want to end with this. I want to bring the gospel to the forefront. Probably one of the most popular uh, verses in all of Scripture, but a very clear gospel presentation. This is what Jesus says in John chapter 3, verses uh, 16 through 18. Just listen to Jesus' words to bring hope to yourself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. So you recognize that Jesus came to rescue the world, not condemn the world. Rescue us from what? Our sin our separation from a holy God. And how do we receive salvation? How do we receive that rescue? It is through belief in Jesus. Belief about Jesus? No. Belief in Jesus' completed work on the cross, that he died in your place and in my place so that you could receive rescue, so that you could have eternal life with him. Friends, if this scares you, you have something to look forward to. That's eternity with Jesus. And all you must do to receive eternity, to receive salvation, is believe on Jesus' completed perfect work. Don't trust in your own works. Don't trust in your own good deeds, but to trust in, rest in, believe in God's completed perfect plan through Jesus' death on the cross. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe a lot of these things are happening. It, it's going to compel those who are looking to other areas for help to turn to Christ, those who have an open mind and are willing to do so. So, folks, uh, we have a couple things coming up here. Josh, 
you have a big event coming up this week. I know it's full, but I, I think we should talk about it for uh, you know future events. Yeah, absolutely. We praise God for the pastor's huddle. Uh, we've had 48 men sign up for that. Some of them are bringing their wives for networking and for encouragement. And what I'd ask you to do is pray for these men, that they would come, be encouraged, be refreshed and excited to move forward, to go back to their churches and proclaim the gospel uh, with a new, renewed um, vigor. And then also, we will have future huddles, Lord willing. And so if your pastor is interested in this, but hasn't had the opportunity to sign up for this huddle, stay tuned because there'll be more information about a huddle coming up potentially later this fall. Absolutely. And then I've been blessed enough to be uh, affiliated with our ministry with uh, some amazing ministries and pastors that are out there. And we're trying to reach the world with the gospel as long as we can. And so mm -hmm. we're traveling to uh, various countries and uh, this our next month in June, from June 16th through the 20th, Pastor Billy Crone, uh, Mondo Gonzalez and myself, we're going to be going to Singapore and Malaysia for a conference. We're going to be at the Para Hotel in Johor Bahru in Malaysia. And I didn't realize it, but we have so many viewers and listeners worldwide that we're trying to reach people with the gospel as long as we can, as long as we can travel, because we don't know how much longer we're going to be able to travel. If some of these things we talked about today are implemented. It's going to be very difficult to travel not only to another country, but outside uh, of, of the city that you live in. So uh, we're going to reach the world as as fast as we can, as much as we can before while there's still time. Yeah. So, And then in June 27th through the 30th, uh, you and I, uh, Pastor Mark, and, and about 24 others, 23 others are going to be in uh, Colorado Springs for the Prophecy Watchers weekend. It's going to be wonderful. Uh, great speakers lined up. Go to their website, uh, prophecywatchers.com. And uh, if you can't make it, sign up for the live stream. I know they're going to offer a live stream. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, if you didn't make the Orlando trip, this one is, is going to be, uh, I think, just fabulous. Who knows what's going to be going on in just a month from now. I mean, it, yeah. it's just insane how fast things are going. It is. So, folks, uh, that's it for this week. Join us again next week. And until then, keep looking up. <laughs>